veterinary dermatologist, so I hear about dermatophyte infections on a daily basis. Um, and so for the deep mold infections, it's typically immunosuppressed dogs and cats that are at risk. And for some reason, cats are much more sensible than dogs. They don't like to self-destruct as much, uh, whereas dogs uh, tend to have a lot of autoimmune diseases. And so we're often um, doing high-level immunosuppression in dogs using drugs like cyclosporin, leflunamide, azathioprine, often combinations of those drugs. Um, and that's when we see these opportunistic mold infections. Um, we also see a variety of endemic mycoses, so we see cryptococcosis, um, definitely more common in cats than in dogs. Uh, we see sporothrix in infections uh, quite a lot at UC Davis, actually. It seems to me that the Vacaville Fairfield area has something going on with sporothrix because we, we see uh, quite a lot of sporothrix infections come from that region. Um, we are seeing a lot more histoplasmosis um, in California, in uh, cats particularly, um, both Southern California and also Northern California. Um, in California, we pretty much never see blastomycosis. It's always in travel dogs that we see that. And, you know, I think reflecting perhaps a short incubation period uh, for blastomycosis in dogs, the dogs that we rarely have seen uh, with blastomycosis have literally just traveled from an endemic area. Um, I did my residency at Minnesota and we saw two to four dogs with blasto a week. Um, so much, much more prevalent up there. And then coccidioides, which is very, very prevalent in dogs, um, but is extremely rare in cats. And of the thousands of dogs with coxy that we see over the last 10 to 15 years at UC Davis, there's only one or two cats. So I think that gives you a perspective as to the uh, relative prevalence in those two species. And then we see opportunistic yeast infections, of course, with candida. And malice seizure is the one that we see most commonly as a superficial mycosis. Okay, so of course the geographic distribution, the spatial distribution of these diseases in dogs and cats is exactly the same as what you would see in, in people. The spatial distribution is identical, so um, the maps for coxie on the left, um, histo in the center, and blasto on the right um, reflects the uh, spatial distribution of the disease in dogs and cats. So all of this is not really new, um, and in fact one of the really, the best studies that illustrated how dogs can be sentinels for human infections um, came from um, Wisconsin several years ago back in the 1990s. And this was actually quite a cool study and still is cited quite a lot. It was a study that came out of this Eagle River area in, in uh, uh, cent north central Wisconsin. Um, and it was a retrospective study where they looked at 59 dogs with blastomycosis over a three year time period that presented to a single veterinary clinic. And um, they showed that over that time period, they saw 1,420 dogs uh, with blasto for every 100,000 dogs seen at the clinic. Uh, and that compared with um, uh, incidence of 101 per 100,000 humans. So about a tenfold increase in dogs compared with people, which is what had been in line with reported previously. And what was interesting was that 21% 20, of owners reported one or more dog or human cases at the address and three of the addresses had more than one dog affected and that was definitely our experience in Minnesota, multiple dogs from the same household often developing blastomycosis. Um, and the disease in dogs followed the same distribution along waterways um, as the disease in humans. So this was a cool study in terms of the controls that they used. Um, they had their dogs with blastomycosis and then they had dogs that were presenting to the veterinary clinic just for routine vaccination. And then their other control group, which was a, a nice control group, was porcupine quill injured dogs. And you can see a picture here of a dog that is being porcupined. Um, and we spent a lot of time extracting these quills from dogs in Minnesota, actually. They're just really awful. Um, but you can imagine that, you know, the, the quill injured dogs would be the same dogs that go outdoors and get exposed um, as the blasto dogs. So I think this really highlighted um, the importance of a good control, but you can see here the mean age of the blasto dogs was about three and a half years. Um, for the vaccinated dogs it was older, um, but it was the same for the quill injured dogs. So again, younger adult dogs going out, getting exposed to blasto. Similarly, um, at face value it seems like male dogs might 
might be more predisposed to blastomycosis when you compare them to vaccinated dogs, but same proportion of male dogs in the quill injured dogs. And then what they did show as being significant was that 95% of the dogs with blasto lived within 400 metres of a waterway compared with only 75% uh, of the vaccinated dogs and 63% of the quill injured dogs. Um, the other factor that was significant was exposure to excavation, uh, which was more prevalent in the blasto dogs than in the quill injured dogs. And there was no association with swimming as an activity or exposure to beaver structures, which was hypothesized as a risk factor for blastomycosis. Um, so the other study that came out um, looking at risk factors for fungal infections in dogs and cats, um, potentially as a sentinel for human disease, was the study that came out of the Pacific Northwest. Um, actually, this, this one came out of British Columbia, looking at Cryptococcus gadii infection in dogs and cats. So this is Colleen Duncan and others, and they divided risk factors. Oh, they divided risk factors into uh, environmental risk factors up here and host-related risk factors. And so the environmental risk factors that were associated with infection were soil disturbance within 10 kilometers of the residents within the last six months and logging within 10 kilometers of residents in the last six months. Um, owner knows of some other cryptococcosis case. Uh, the owners had visited a botanic garden uh, in the last six months and the owners had been hiking in the last six months, which probably just reflects the fact that these owners go outdoors, potentially might bring soil back into the household. And of the host-related uh, factors, unrestrained activity outdoors, which made sense, travel on Vancouver Island in the last year, um, and hunting activities are some of the examples of risk factors that they identified. Great, so that brings us to um, the study that we recently completed looking at risk factors for coccidioid mycosis in dogs. Um, this is a study that I did um, with Sharon Grazel, who's a practitioner from um, Oregon, and Beatrice Martinez-Lopez, who's a spatial epidemiologist at UC Davis. And so it was a case control study. We looked at 41 dogs seen at UC Davis with coccidioid mycosis, and then we had um, twice that number of control dogs. And the control dogs were dogs that were seen immediately before or immediately after the coxie case that had had um, blood work, urinalysis done. So same reasons for coming to UC Davis, willing to do all of those diagnostic tests. And then we prospectively uh, surveyed clients both by telephone and also via survey monkey survey. Um, and we didn't tell them what we were doing the study about, but just asked them a variety of questions about the animal's travel history uh, and, and risk factors. Um, we got a very detailed travel history from all of the patients in the study. Um, and then we did a lo logistic regression analysis to look at some of the risk factors. So one of the really neat things that came out of this study was looking at how dogs travel. And it's amazing how widely they move. And no one's actually really looked at how dogs travel. This is really the first study where someone's mapped travel of dogs um, all around the world. And so these dogs were going all over the place. They were moving internationally. They were moving throughout North America and lots of travel within California as well. Um, and so if you look at risk factors that we identified, um, the risk factors that emerged as being significant after um, multivariable analysis were that dogs with coxie were more likely to be younger than the control dogs, which made sense. But digging behavior was a huge risk factor, sevenfold increase in risk for dogs that were known to be diggers. Um, so this um, may explain you know, the predisposition of dogs to coccidioid mycosis from exposure. Um, similarly, strong association with travel to Arizona or California Central Valley, male sex, and um, this is um, uh, borderline significant, but camping trips um, negatively. So places where coxie is, people don't tend to go camping. <laughs> um, and then the, some of the things that we looked at that were not ultimately retained in the multivariable model were age of home, property size, proportion of the property with exposed soil, amount of time spent outdoors, going to dog parks, hiking, working and sporting activities. So then we were able to create, um, using the model, a risk map for coccidioidomycosis in dogs and county-based risk map. And um, you can see this is the risk map over here. Um, and then we were able to compare this um, to the incidence map for coccidioidomycosis in humans in 2012, which was really the best data that we had available for comparison. We didn't have a, um, a risk map as such um, 
for uh, humans, but we had this incidence map. And there was a very strong correlation between the two maps, except for this little area here, um, hotspot up in uh, north central California. And so we think it's uh, worthwhile keeping an eye on this area because it may be an area that we see more human disease with uh, human coccidioidomycosis. And so, you know, if you go to the uh, outbreak in, or the appearance of cases now in, in uh, eastern Washington, it's funny because, of course, there were cases identified in humans, and when they went backwards and looked at the veterinary diagnostic laboratory, sure enough, they identified two dogs and a person um, back uh, in between 1997 and in 2012. Um, and interestingly, when I first started at UC Davis, a vet from Eastern Washington sent me a slide from a dog that he thought had coccidioidomycosis. And he said, this is weird, this dog's never traveled, but I think this is a spheral. And I looked at the slide and I was like, I think that's a spheral too. And that was the end of that. So, probably should have paid more attention. So, um, now, the other thing I want to do, and I'm kind of diverging away, I'm, I know we're not in an Aspergillus session here, but I do want to talk a little bit about our research work with Aspergillus fumigatus um, in dogs, because um, it's really quite interesting what we've uncovered. So we see Aspergillus fumigatus in dogs causing um, a couple of different clinical syndromes. The main one is sinonasal aspergillosis, and this is a very common disease. It's very, very frustrating to treat and to diagnose. And these dogs um, have infection of their nasal cavity and the uh, fungus actually erodes through the nasal turbinates and then ultimately erodes through the cribriform plate and um, dogs with advanced disease can actually present with aspergillus meningitis because the fungus um, travels through the cribriform plate into the brain. Uh, very, very devastating disease and it smoulders because it can't be seen from the outside um, and oftentimes owners bring their dogs repeatedly to their veterinarians and they're given antibacterial drugs for chronic nasal discharge when in fact there's a fungus there progressively eroding the nasal turbinates. Um, diagnosis actually requires CT scan followed by rhinoscopy and you can see um, this is a CT scan of a dog with sinonasal aspergillosis here um, and you can see all the destruction of the nasal turbinates. And we treat these dogs with repeated topical clotrimazole therapy. So we know that um, German Shepherds are predisposed to this disease, um, although we see a variety of different breeds with it. And we know that long-nosed breeds are predisposed, and we also see sinonasal aspergillosis in dogs following chemoembolization of nasal tumors, which we've been doing at UC Davis, and following radiation therapy to the nasal cavity. Um, and we've seen some dogs with grass and foreign bodies associated with focal aspergillus fumigatus infections as well. Um, and so we were interested in what other risk factors were present, especially, especially spatial uh, risk factors um, and environmental risk factors. And so we um, recently completed this study, which is as yet unpublished, um, but we looked at 250 dogs with sinonasal aspergillosis at the hospital from 1990 to, to 2014. And then we had a reference population of nearly 200,000 dogs from the same catchment area. Um, and uh, again, Dr. Martinez Lopez was a spatial epidemiologist on this project, um, and we did uh, a multivariate logistic regression model to look at environmental and climatic factors. And what we found was associated with, infection, with infections with the disease were areas of high traffic density, um, so potentially a role of pollution there, um, active compo composting sites, and uh, a negative factor was agriculture, and then there was um, some associations with um, changes in wind over time and changes in temperature over time. But we looked at 29 other variables, including soil type, soil moisture, pesticide use, ozone, precipitation, fire history, vegetation type. So we looked at lots and lots of different environmental um, factors, um, and they never made it to the final model. So you can see um, the maps here of the disease on the top left. So this is where the dogs with sinonasal aspergillosis came from. And you could sort of, if you use your imaginoscope, see an association with the composting sites, um, which is very, very fascinating to me. And then this is uh, traffic density, uh, wind difference, temperature difference, and then the agricultural areas, remembering they had a, a negative association. So then we were able to create this um, predictive risk map um, using the model. 
and identify counties that had the highest uh, risk of cyanonasal aspergillosis in dogs. And so it may be that pollution is having some effect on cyanonasal dis uh, uh, defences in dogs. Um, we know that areas that had a big change in wind over the last uh, 10 to 15 years were coastal and urban areas that potentially have more construction, but we're not sure of the, of the reason for that association. We know Aspergillus fumigatus uh, thrives in composting piles. Um, and then we hypothesize that perhaps it's the fungicides that are used on crops that are uh, leading to the negative association with uh, agriculture. And I, so I think all of these things have implications for human respiratory infections with Aspergillus fumigatus as well. Okay, so I'm going to uh, finish off a little bit on cryptococcosis, um, some of the work that we've been done, doing on crypto in dogs and cats, which is really fascinating and I think uh, brings some conversation into what we've been talking about relating to hosts uh, versus molecular types and clinical patterns of disease. Um, so we see cryptococcus quite a lot in cats and to a lesser extent in dogs in California. And in the past, veterinary diagnostic laboratories just reported all cryptococcus isolates as cryptococcus neoformans. They didn't distinguish between between Gadii and Neoformans. So we were interested in uh, looking at that and also what molecular types were circulating in California. So we first published this retrospective study looking at 62 cats and 31 dogs with cryptococcosis. And what we found was that the cats were almost always infected with cryptococcus Gadii, pretty much 100%. And most of them were infected with VG3. And we had a few cats from Northern California that were infected with VG2, VG2A primarily. Um, but the dogs were never infected with molecular type VG3. Never, not once. Um, but they were more, most commonly infected with Cryptococcus neoformans. So we saw a lot of dogs with C. neoformans infections. And then a few dogs that had Cryptococcus gadii VG2 infections. And what was really interesting was there, there is a difference in um, latex agglutination titers um, in cats versus dogs. Cats tend to have much higher um, cryptococcal antigen titers than dogs do. And in fact, we often see false negative um, serum cryptococcal antigen titers in dogs that have widely disseminated disease, including meningitis. So whether that relates to the differences in um, molecular types that are infecting the two species or if there's other factors are involved, I'm not sure, but it's very interesting. And when dogs are infected with Cryptococcus neoformans, they always have widely disseminated disease and they look just like human patients with um, AIDS. So they have uh, yeast everywhere, uh, in all tissues, in their brain, or, you know, every single necrops we, we do, uh, they have cryptococcal meningitis. This particular dog was a basset hound um, that came to us with signs of acute pancreatitis. Um, thought it was just an inflammatory pancreatitis, but an aspirate was done of the pancreas and there was large numbers of cryptococcus um, organisms in the pancreas and this dog didn't make it, um, but at necropsy, um, what was really uh, fascinating is this is a, the nasal cavity of this dog and you can see, or you may or may not be able to see from where you're sitting, that we've got these perfect colonies of cryptococcus actually just sit, hanging out in the nasal cavity. But when dogs are infected with cryptococcus gadii, they have solitary mass lesions and they don't have uh, widely disseminated disease. So they have solitary nasal cavity lesions, most typically cryptococcomas in the caudal nasal cavity that sometimes extend through the cribriform plate. So this is um, an MRI of a dog um, that has uh, Cryptococcus gadii VG2 infection, um, huge Cryptococcoma invading through the Cribriform plate into the brain, and no Cryptococcus at necropsy anywhere else. Um, when cats are infected, they commonly get Cryptococcal meningitis. Um, this is um, uh, MRI of a cat that had um, uh, Cryptococcus uh, gadii infection, and they, we see the same pattern with VG2 or VG3 infections. Um, we actually see these, um, we actually see these uh, pseudocysts here, and uh, we now have been able to characterize these lesions and correlate them to lesions at necropsy. They're high T2, low T1 lesions, and now our uh, diagnostic imaging specialists at the university, they can just look at the MRI and say, I know what that is, a very characteristic lesion on MRI. 
Um, we also see cats with um, these very large mass lesions, especially infected with VG3. Um, and this is a cat um, that had an enormous mediastinal mass. This is all a huge cryptococcoma here. Um, and this cat actually went to surgery to try to remove this huge mass lesion. I'm not sure that that was the right choice in retrospect. The cat um, died during a recovery from anesthesia, had necropsy, and despite coming in and looking perfectly mentally normal, normal behavior um, on presentation that the cat had cryptococcal meningitis. It was just subclinical um, and the, the clinical signs all referred to this mediastinal mass. So we um, looked at where these molecular types were. Um, we didn't find any VG2 isolates south of Fresno. There was actually only one, but it was a traveled animal that had come from British Columbia. Um, and so no VG2 south of Fresno. Um, VG3s are in yellow, so you can see that lots of scattered VG3s, um, all of them again in cats. And then some untraveled cats and dogs with VG2 infections. And so with Velen Meyer, um, we did um, some MLST work um, on these isolates. And again, similar to in human patients, we got um, clustering of the VG3s into three, two to three groups. Um, you can see up here. And so some, um, some in really interesting um, information coming out of dogs and cats as well, and mim mimicking that in people. Um, and then um, we did show that there was a lot more uh, range of MICs among the C. gadii isolates than the C. neoformans isolates. And so that might reflect the variability that we saw in, among, uh, sort of in the C. gadii isolates um, in terms of um, their sequence variability also seemed to relate to their variability in antifungal susceptibility. So this, I've got just a couple of cases to show you before I finish up. Um, this is a, a cat, Samantha, a five-year-old female spayed domestic long hair that had nasal cryptococcosis, um, and we isolated Cryptococcus gadii VG3 um, from her nasal cavity. Um, and so this cat had an initial clinical response to fluconazole with complete uh, regression of clinical signs. And what we've seen with these cats that have VG3 infections is when you treat them, they often do um, seem to recover, but they maintain very high antigen titers. And then later, months, years later, they relapse with clinical disease again, and this is what this cat did. So the first isolate that we obtained from um, this cat, you can see the MICs there. Um, in particular, I just want to point out the fluconazole MIC of 0.5. And then this cat subsequently had a poor response to treatment with fluconazole. She was treated with amphotericin B, then itraconazole, and then posaconazole, but this mass just continued to enlarge and became ulcerated. Um, and so then we were subsequently able to obtain another isolate from the cat's uh, nasal cavity in the face of uh, antifungal drug therapy. And now the MIC to fluconazole was at 256 which is really interesting that it was pretty much just fluconazole that had that dramatic increase. And so we worked with um, George Thompson and um, Angie Gelly to look at perhaps the mechanism of resistance um, in this particular fungal isolate. Um, and so um, in uh, Dr. Thompson's lab, it was shown that serial exposure of the first isolate to drug-free media required 87 transfers um, for the isolate to lose resistance. Oh, it should be number two, sorry. And then ex exposure of the first isolate, I got those back to front, to fluconazole containing media led to resistance in just 10 transfers. Both of the isolates were uh, genetically equivalent based on MLST. Um, and then um, using quantitative P uh, PCR, uh, we were able to show that there was an increased expression of ERG11 uh, and PDR11 genes. So um, 1.9 fold increase in copy number of ERG11 and 2.6 fold increase in copy number of PDR11. So um, potentially that is the mechanism of resistance in this particular case. So this is just another case of Berman here, um, diagnosed in September of 2011 with cryptococcosis, nasal skin, oral lesions, and cryptotida, initially 1 to 32,000. This cat was started on fluconazole, did really well, all lesions resolved, but then another um, cryptococcal antigen titer was still high despite resolution of disease. Um, again, March the following year, still positive titer, and then the cat came back, 
three months after that, still doing well clinically, but now the antigen titer is 32,768. And so what we've seen is ultimately these cat, cats relapse. So that seems to be what we're seeing with VG3. But when you look at VG2 isolates, this is a cat Tuthra that had um, cryptococcal meningitis with neurologic signs. And I've actually got a little video of this cat here. So this cat has bilateral medriasis, dilated pupils, mentally very obtunded. Um, the cat had just had uh, a CSF tap done, but this is exactly how it looked when it first came to see us, very depressed. And an MRI was done, and again, these high T2, low T1 lesions, a little bit of peripheral contrast enhancement here in this lesion, in this cat's brain, and then CSF tap, lots of uh, cryptococcus. Um, and then we subsequently did molecular typing. Uh, Veal and Meyer did that, and it was uh, VG2A. And uh, then uh, cryptococcal antigen titer 1 to 32,000, pretty typical for a cat. This cat was treated with deoxycholate, amphotericin B, fluconazole. We do give these cats prednisolone. We do give them glucocorticoids for a very short period of time, and it really does seem to help them. Um, usually they get worse neurologic signs if you don't give them steroids, and many of them die during that period of time. So we do also treat briefly with glucocorticoids. Um, and so this is day six following treatment. Still doesn't look very happy, but um, able to hold his head up and uh, um, definitely mentally more aware. And then this is at three months um, post-treatment, and you can see this cat looks like a healthy domestic short hair. Um, and then, so Tathra came back to see us one year um, post-treatment, still on itraconazole actually, and the titer was one to 20. Um, and I think we treated for another year, at which time the cat's uh, antigen titer was negative. So this is what we see with VG2 infections. This type of pattern, response to treatment, cat's cured, um, everything's good, but with the VG3, we don't see that, and the prognosis is typically not as good. Finally, we see a lot of dog breeds that we have identified susceptibility to fungal infections in. Um, and when we did our cryptococcus study, um, one third of the dogs with cryptococcosis were American Cocker Spaniels. So we got all excited about doing a study at looking at the genetics of cryptococcosis in American Cocker Spaniels. And then we never saw another American Cocker Spaniel with cryptococcosis. <laughs> So I think they all died um, of cryptococcosis. Um, and then they were breeding some more resistant dogs. Um, and then we recently identified Dalmatians, Vigelas, Wemeranas, Greyhounds, English Pointers, Bull Terriers, Brittany Spaniels, and Boxers as being at increased risk for coccidioid and mycosis. But Dalmatians and Vigelas stick out like a sore thumb. We see a lot of Vigelas and Dalmatians. Um, and then we know that dogs with disseminated aspergillosis, two thirds of them are German shepherd dogs, and of those, those German shepherds, nearly 80% of them are female, so there's some association with sex as well as breed there. So we're just about to embark on a, a genome-wide association analysis um, with a, a geneticist, Annika Banish, um, and so uh, Jonathan Deere is working with myself and uh, George Thompson, Danica Banish, um, to look at the susceptibility to this disease in German shepherds. So all of this work has been done with the help of a lot of other people, and I, I want to acknowledge them all here. Um, this list isn't exhaustive, but um, Beatrice Martinez-Lopez, George Thompson, Angie Jelly, um, and lots of other people at UC Davis, um, team at University of Sydney, and our work has been supported by the Centre for Companion Animal Health at UC Davis. This is a picture that my son drew. Henry, when he was six, he drew a picture of Cryptococcus gadii, which I thought was very cool for a six-year-old. <laughs> So thanks very much. I really appreciate the opportunity to come talk to you about 